Welcome everyone. Uh, let's get started. We hope you're all enjoying Reunions Week and thanks for joining us today for Geeks to Activists, Social Movements and Social Media. I'm Laura Bowers Highlanday, Trinity 06 Fuqua 12, and I'll be moderating Nigar's talk this afternoon. Um, just a few reminders, as I'm sure you're aware, this event is co-sponsored by Forever Learning Institute and DAAA. DAAA is a Duke Asian Alumni Alliance, the newest alumni affinity group. We're dedicated to building a unified Duke Asian and Asian American community and providing opportunities for social, personal, and professional development by engaging alumni, staff, students, faculty, and surrounding communities. Just a little bit of housekeeping, we do have the Q&A function enabled, so please feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A function throughout the presentation or during the Q&A session. Thank you all again so much for joining, and now I'll hand it over to Nagar to begin our presentation. Hi, everyone. It's, uh, incredibly, uh, it's an incredible honor to see all of you and uh, see where you're from, from Boston to Texas, uh, India, Manila. Um, it's a real honor uh, to join you today. So. Um, I'm going to go through a series of slides and and talk about um, uh, talk about the social movements that I've been researching and um, uh, working with my students on uh, in my social movements and social media class. And so there's a there are a lot of slides um, that I would like to go through and talk about. So. Let's start. Um, uh, the work that I did in uh, 2015, I, I wrote a book on hashtag Iran election, which was one of the first network social movements, basically uh, uh, a social movement that um, came together and communicated from online platforms. Hashtag Iran election was one of the first to use the hashtag and uh, it was the first to use the uh, digital camera to report on uh, on on uh, an, an event, uh, a news event that was going on. Um, basically, uh, engage uh, what they called amateur amateur journalists or citizen journalists at the time. Um, hashtag Iran election was also one of the first movements to um, use the uh, filtered overlay over avatars or profile pictures as a way to show the collective identity of the movement and um, also used selfies as a way to to indicate this kind of collectivity. Um, I refer to these activities as a way of uh, as the narrative capacity of a movement, the capacity to change the status quo uh, narrative of a culture or society uh, to impact that, change people's hearts and minds. Um, there are other capacities that social movements have. Um, and a lot of digital movements uh, or network social movements don't have these disruptive capacities, for example, uh, blocking bridges and roads, um, uh, uh, protesting in marches, um, in this case, uh, asking for a recount of the vote. Um, many, uh, many network social movements uh, such as hashtag Iran election, uh, which addressed a fraudulent election in uh, Iran in 2009, um, ha managed to garner a large number of people. Um, they, they bring together a large number of people around hashtags and um, online activism, but uh, uh, so they have a collective identity in large numbers, 
but they are really not very good at making an impact in the political sphere. And really the question is why? Um, why is it that, that social change doesn't necessarily happen um, uh, with movements that have so many people um, involved? Um, I think part of the problem is that uh, network social movements actually don't engage in muscle building, in face-to-face -face contact, like making coffee together or photocopying or planning uh, how to get uh, their participants to a march, those kinds of things that really build the, the muscle of the movement. Uh, Zainab Tufikchi, who is a, a who's uh, a colleague of mine in, um, at UNC, uh, calls these uh, this taking care of network internalities. So taking care of everyday, ordinary, quotidian, uh, kind of tedious work actually builds the mu muscle of movements and makes it strong over the long term. Many network social movements are like flocks. They come together very briefly uh, around a hashtag or around a, a trigger, and then they disperse. Um, one of the things that I discovered this summer with Black Lives Matter was, was that in fact, uh, fandoms, which, usually come together around the passions of, of the fans, around an, an issue that the fans are passionate about, are actually better at taking care of their network internalities. So they have stronger muscles. Why? Because they have a greater level of intimacy. They're constantly talking to each other about something that they're passionate about. And they're together uh, over the long term. So I'm going to talk about two case studies of, of fandoms that really uh, are more like tribes, right? They are unlike uh, flocks that come together and disperse. They're like tribes. They, they hang together over the long term, communicate, uh, are intensely involved with each other and kind of intimately not uh, there. They have an intimate knowledge of, of each other's ways, which allows them to change tactics on a dime. So this is a fandom that uh, ships uh, Harry Potter and Draco. Uh, shipping is, is the act that fans do, which is bring together two characters that are not really together, are not in relationship uh, in a book or a movie. Um, and uh, in, the, in, in, a, in a sort of a, in a, in a love affair. So uh, this is a fandom called the hashtag Drary fandom. And um, they are really all about how Harry Potter and Draco actually belong together, or should be in relationship to each other. They uh, exchange uh, fake uh, text messages and memes uh, like the one here. Uh, they have come, they, they, they act as if, uh, you know, Draco and, and, and Harry are, uh, are in conversation with each other. They create uh, fan art where they show the two paired together. Um, this is a way to provide, um, for the fandom to provide a critique about the construction of gender and sexuality in contemporary society. And in this way affect the status quo narrative around, um, uh, around relationships. Uh, um, from, from heteronormative notions of love uh, to sort of an acceptance of uh, queer, um, queer relationships and uh, queer identities. Um, this, uh, this fandom is uh, also about, um, well, this fandom actually uh, oftentimes uses fan art that suggests that Harry, Harry Potter, 
is actually dark skinned or black. And, and so the Draco relationship is oftentimes represented as, uh, as, as an interracial relationship. Uh, in this way, they, the fandom transcends uh, um, ideas of, of race, uh, gender, and in fact, uh, at times also biological uh, roles. In this relationship, um, Harry or Draco alternately um, uh, get pregnant. And uh, this is considered a way to, um, to shift, uh, shift the view, uh, views on female sexual objectification um, uh, and uh, I guess, yeah, that, that's, that's all I want to say about this. Um, uh, this movement uh, really, uh, or I guess this, this fandom uh, really is engaged in, in shifting notions of heteronormativity and um, stultified notions of sexuality and race in contemporary uh, in contemporary culture. Another fandom that uh, that I want to share with you, this is the second case study, is um, the race bending fandom. As many of you know, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, uh, we did, Hollywood did away with blackface. Um, but yellow face is, is still something that um, is practiced in Hollywood films and um, uh, uh, cable uh, series. And this is the idea of using prosthetics to uh, simulate crude notions of, of, of what an Asian, Asian features look like. Um, the race bending fandom actually uh, started in um, 2007 before social platforms were used for activism. Um, it was started around this, uh, this uh, series, Avatar, The Last Airbender, which uh, net you can now find on um, Netflix. It's, um, an ex it's an ex uh, extensively researched um, uh, series that borrows from uh, diverse practices of art, uh, Buddhist art, Taoism, yoga, um, and, and different forms of animation style. Uh, the, the, the race bending fandom and its activism actually started around a controversy when uh, they were they were thinking of turning the last airbender into a live action film uh, three of the main characters were being cast um, by unknown actors of non-asian descent and one actor, the enemy Zuko, uh, was uh, was cast by, um, I, I guess, uh, by a dark skinned, you know, slam dunk, uh, dunk millionaire. Um, the the race bending uh, fandom uh, was really upset about about this fact and started a letter campaign uh, uh, encouraging, uh, encouraging Hollywood to, uh, to find Asian actors to pray, play the role of the uh, Asian characters in the film. So they started off in 2008 as a letter campaign, uh, with letter campaigns, which is what fans usually have been doing uh, since uh, Star Trek, since the Star Trek, Trek fandom. 
but then um, started using online community spaces such as Facebook and Twitter and, and live blog uh, to uh, distribute digital downloadables, um, posters, and uh, to do their media outreach uh, and protest. Uh, they also did direct protests on the ground outside of the theaters um, and uh, made calls to boycott, recast, and delay the filming. They did a lot of awareness and uh, advocacy around uh, fair casting uh, and hiring practices. Um, because they had been working together over the long term, they actually managed to, um, to shift their tactics as they, as they work together. And as a result, they managed to affect not only the ticket sales once the last Airbender movie came out, but also affected uh, the reviews of the film, where even Roger Ebert uh, says that the casting here in this film um, makes no sense. Uh, so one of the things that, that I notice, like looking at these two case studies is that they not only, uh, you know, they, they not only have the numbers and, and they have a unified collective identity as fans of, um, you know, the Avatar uh, series or fans of the Harry Potter series. They also have the capacity to change the narrative, uh, the established narrative of, of culture by, by engaging uh, with, this, with this material that they're passionate about. Uh, they, have a, they have the capacity to disrupt uh, by protesting on the ground, blocking uh, 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 blocking ticket sales or casting calls. Um, and they also have an institutional capacity. Uh, they can um, they can they affect uh, ticket sales, they can they can, uh, change the minds of producers and, and, and have companies that, that support films uh, pull out of, um, uh, pull, pull out of sponsorship. Okay, this, this actually brings me to the final example, which many of us remember from this summer, uh, the summer of 2020. Uh, where Black Lives Matter became, uh, came to the attention of, um, uh, of a large number of, of people, millions around the world, uh, especially around the, the killing of uh, George Floyd. One of the things that happened this summer um, was that fandoms came to surprisingly came together in support of a social movement. And this was really the first time that we saw that fandoms that have this narrative capacity, disruptive capacity, institutional capacity, and a solid long-term collective identity come in support of a social movement or a flock that, that um, flocks together for a short period of time and then disperses. So the coalition that came together were K-pop stands or, or fandoms that uh, enjoy K-pop music, Korean pop music, um, the BTS ARMY, which is a fandom around a boy band um, called BTS, a Korean boy band called BTS, um, the Witches of Instagram, the Amish, uh, Anonymous, uh, and the L LGBTQ plus community, uh, along with celebrities and many allies in the US and internationally, they all came together to protest 
uh, police brutality against black and brown bodies in the US. I want to show you a brief clip uh, that, uh, that, that shows us the, the, the types of groups and people that came together, the geeks that came together uh, to support a movement. It's over. Look, look who we got. Look who we got. We got Anonymous. We have witches. We have the Amish. We got people of color. We got LGBT plus people. And we got the fucking Karens. We will literally hack you, hex you, have God forsake you, speak to the manager about you, never cook you delicious food ever again, or share culture with you, and have no one fucking do your hair or be your interior decorator. Well, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. I know dropped in the chat um, was more information about the Forever Learning Institute um, in terms of the, the other great programs that are happening. Uh, for the for DAAA, the Duke Asian Alumni Alliance, we are gonna be sending our Q2 newsletter the first week in May. Um, so please keep a lookout for that if you um, are an Asian or Asian American alum. And we also are active on Facebook and LinkedIn. So please request to join our private groups. Um, I hope all the rest of you enjoy Reunions Week. And Nigar, thank you so much for the wonderful talk and conversation for answering everyone's questions. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>